So welcome to um, the Policy Lab uh, Crazy Two Days. This is the first time in the history of this program that these Policy Lab presentations have happened in person uh, for obvious reasons. Policy Lab number one is the Canadian Nuclear Association. We have uh, coming up in whatever order they want to do it, because it's their presentation, Mohammed, Umar, Montajima, and Jacqueline. So take it away, team. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we're happy to be here this morning kicking off the Policy Lab presentations and sharing ours, challenges and opportunities in scaling up Canada's clean hydrogen economy, drawing attention to the potential of nuclear energy. I'm Jacqueline, and I'm here today with Umar, Tazneem, and Hamza. Um, before beginning, we'd like to uh, mention that we're grateful to our sponsor organization, the Canadian Nuclear Association, and the work of John Stewart in supporting us throughout this project. We also extend a special thank you to our coach, Jonathan Arnold, for his ongoing feedback, knowledge, and support, and we're also appreciative of the work of Natalie Duchesne in coordinating this project. We'll begin by introducing you to the topic by contextualizing the overall interest in the hydrogen economy and offering some background regarding Canada's particular interest in hydrogen. We'll then discuss the different production pathways that can be pursued in terms of making hydrogen. The key ones in include fossil fuels, renewables such as hydro, wind and solar, or nuclear. We'll also present a criteria framework with which these pathways can be evaluated and ranked. We'll then move on to discussing market barriers to scaling clean hydrogen production. And then to complement the supply side discussion about production pathways, we will also look at the end use demand side of the economy, identifying some key sectors that could transition to hydrogen-based fuels as a means of increasing hydrogen demand. Before concluding, we'll discuss our four recommendations which address production, demand, research and development, and infrastructure, and we'll present our action plan. Before beginning, we'd like to briefly go over the questions that we were given that guided our research. So our challenge question asked, what types of, gov of government policies are needed, if any, to scale up the production of clean hydrogen in Canada? Um, we were also given a series of challenges and opportunities that asked us to uh, consider the tensions between the federal government's emerging vision for a hydrogen economy and some of the challenges that are making it difficult to realize that vision. So these challenges primar primarily include differences between fuel sources in terms of stability, in terms of the costs and availabilities of technologies needed to use those fuel sources, and the life cycle carbon emissions produced with each fuel source. These questions identified the need for a clean and reliable fuel source, thereby extending an opportunity for nuclear energy. We would like to just briefly mention our methodology. There's a lot more content about this within our report, um, and we will happily refer you to that, but we'd just like to mention a few limitations we encountered, uh, notably that there was limited research available to consult, specifically as it related to nuclear energy, so we were pretty dependent on our stakeholder interviews for that expertise. Um, and it was also challenging to quantify the net benefits of hydrogen production given that many of the considerations were not actually quantifiable. So in our introduction, we have combined a discussion about why hydrogen is important along with a brief background describing Canada's need for hydrogen energy. Canada's 2030 emissions reductions plan strives to reduce emissions by 40 to 45 percent from 2000 levels by 2030 and then to net zero by 2050. Although Canada already has an extensive network of low-carbon energy sources, the high-emitting oil and gas industry remains a big player when it comes to supplying Canada's significant energy demands. Hydrogen is a low-carbon-emitting energy source that could play a major role in the energy transition. Hydrogen is a dense energy carrier that can be utilized by deploying fuel cell technology, which converts chemical energy into electrical energy, with the only byproduct being water. This makes it a very attractive fuel for the net zero transition because it can help decarbonize many of today's high carbon emitting sectors such as vehicle transport and industrial applications. As such, global hydrogen demand is rising and it has been estimated that the global hydrogen market has the potential to reach up to $2.5 trillion by 2050 with just the Canadian hydrogen and fuel cell sectors having the potential to generate $47 billion in revenue by 2050. This growth will be supported by an estimated 350,000 new high paying jobs by 2050. There are different pathways that can be used in producing hydrogen, and they differ in, ter in terms of their carbon intensity. My colleague Umar will discuss these further in the next slide, but uh, these pathways have traditionally been defined by a color codification scheme that associates each path to a color to describe the carbon intensity of its production. 
However, uh, this scheme is overly simplistic and can even jeopardize accurate economic projections since there are no clear defining uh, standards for the carbon intensity of each color. Therefore, throughout this presentation, we will simply use the term clean hydrogen in reference to hydrogen that is produced with zero emissions. Despite these benefits, Canada's hydrogen economy is still undeve undeveloped. A circular causality problem is a primary barrier to developing the hydrogen economy, whereby the cost of low carbon hydrogen production remains high and demand is low. Driving up demand will help to achieve economies of scale and lower costs of production. Government policies could be used to stimulate both the supply and demand sides of the hydrogen economy so that Canada can pursue the hydrogen path as they strive towards a net zero while still yielding the aforementioned economic benefits. I will now hand it off to my colleague Umar to discuss the production pathways in more detail. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, so one of the key challenges actually right now, but we, what uh, Jacqueline mentioned about the uh, hydrogen production is the pathway that how this hydrogen is being produced. Right like now we are producing about 3 million tons per year of hydrogen that is primarily used in the uh, ammonia production or oil refining in Alberta or something, but that is coming through fossil fuel. Right there, small, small little scientific equation, I won't touch, uh, I won't go into details, but what's happening here is CH4, that is methane, when we, uh, uh, when, when a certain reaction goes with steam, that is in form of, uh, uh, water in form of steam, what we produce is hydrogen, and then we utilize this hydrogen, but we have this carbon dioxide that is being produced in this production pathway, which is uh, not desirable in this uh, whole process. What we want is we, ha we should have zero carbon, di carbon dioxide produced throughout this production pathway, but at this point, since we are producing a lot of hydrogen with this, uh, with this steam, steam uh, methane reforming process, we are producing about nine kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen. So that makes it in a, a pathway that we actually don't want to use for longer time. What we want here is that some process that has actually no carbon dioxide produced at all, that is what we call green hydrogen. What we are proposing at this point, or what we think is a solution to that way is to couple this steam methane reforming process with carbon capturing and storage technology. So what, what could happen is that we uh, capture and then store this carbon dioxide and then may utilize it for further applications where we can use this carbon dioxide for, uh, for carbon fiber, carbon black, or other applications of that sort. At this point, what we are, uh, what we are experiencing is we, although we claim like we have in Canada, we have a lot of cheaper, clean uh, electricity, but we, uh, through this, uh, uh, this report and uh, through this literature, we, what we experience is that we don't have that much electricity, what we think is uh, could be utilized for hydrogen production. How hydroelectric and solar and wind could be utilized and then green electricity could be used for hydrogen production is a way for, that is, uh, there's a process called electrolysis, or what in scientific term we call water splitting. What happens here is, that we have uh, H2O that we can split through electrolysis process with intense green, clean hydro, uh, clean electricity. We can split those uh, molecules in hydrogen and oxygen and then store them and utilize. This is what we call clean hydrogen, but this is not a reality that could be realized in short term. And then here comes the production pathway where we can use the nuclear energy and then use can use the electricity produced through nuclear for this water splitting process or the excess heat that is being produced in the nuclear power plants for electrolysis process as well. But what right now we, uh, for, for, for the color coding that Jacqueline mentioned, we are saying this steam methane reforming as gray, what we call or what we refer to high carbon intensity in our report, then there's low carbon intensity that is the steam methane reforming with carbon capturing and storage technology. Here we reduce the carbon actually one kilogram of uh, one kilogram of carbon dioxide production one for one kilo, kilogram of hydrogen, but for the remaining purpose, the uh, good thing is we don't see any carbon dioxide being produced. So that is kind of a thing we, uh, my colleague Hamza would discuss in recommendations that why we are uh, proposing clean hydrogen production pathway. But just to talk. Just to talk ab about the pros and cons of these different production pathways, we, uh, uh, we, uh, we identified a few different parameters that should be talked when we are producing hydrogen. What, very first is economic efficiency, like what is exactly the cost of that each production pathway. We figured out that the, carbon, uh, the hydrogen that is produced through fossil fuel is about $1, less than $1 per kilogram. 
and when we couple it with CCS, that is about two dollars, about twice. And then with hydro and wind, it's too expensive. For example, with hydro, solar, and wind, it's about four dollars per kilogram of hydrogen, and with nuclear, almost almost five dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. In the next uh, parameter, practicality, and then we uh, we consider like, okay, we want to have clean hydrogen, but is it possible at this stage or not? We figured out different parameters, and then from the key informants and the literature review, we have uh, uh, means uh, uh, made this table. That, and then also we talked about environmental sustainability in two different aspects. One is climate change that is directly related to carbon emissions, and the second one that, that is related to non-climate, for example, deforestation, land use, and all those aspects. And the safety concerns, what people think about this particular pathway. For example, let's talk about nuclear. We, we figured out that people have a perception that something happened about 50 years ago to the nuclear, and they have still in that mind. And people think it might not be the good idea to use nuclear at this stage. But at some point, if we have developed hydrogen economy, we have enough clean electricity, coming through uh, nuclear industry, we might capitalize on this, and then we can use this nuclear-based uh, hydrogen production. And then scalability, okay, we want that nuclear energy or nuclear power plants for hydrogen, but is it scalable at this point? Since this frame f framework is for short term, we think uh, nuclear does have this new technology, SMRs, uh, small modular reactors coming up, but they're not fully established that we could use their, its potential at this point for hydrogen production. So we discussed all this table in detail in, in report, but we would just, because of the time constraint, we would just limit a couple of uh, uh, parameters that I just discussed. So if hydrogen has this much potential, then what's stopping it? So what's stopping it is all those things. First, the high capital cost of SMRs, for example, that is about $500 per kilowatt hour. We can't right away put it in place for hydrogen production. Then electrolyzer, which is a huge price. The electrolyzer is a device that is actually used for electrolysis to split the hydrogen and oxygen that I uh, just uh, mentioned in previous slides. So all those capital costs and then carbon capturing and storage, industries are not willing to put a lot of money in carbon capturing and storing and then use that facility only for hydrogen production. So this is one of the uh, barriers we, are, uh, we have for hydrogen economy. And then since it has low volumetric densities because it's in gaseous form, so we have to first compress this hydrogen and then transport it either through pipelines, trucks, then about pipelines, we have a certain perception in Canada whether we should have further pipelines or not. But what's important is what, go, what flows through those pipelines, whether it's oil or green hydrogen or what's that. But it is a challenge that how to transport hydrogen because there are certain safety concerns associated with this transportation. Then storage, same thing. It has it has to be stored in liquid uh, liquid form, not in gaseous form, because of its uh, low volumetric density. And then also, industries have have been experiencing a problem, particularly to standards and codes. Like right now, we don't have uh, that much uh, market for hydrogen, so that industries are not sure. Like if we produce hydrogen, if it goes to the final applications, how would appliances go for that? How are the uh, industrial cords and government cords to use this. But for one of the pilot projects that is being run in Fort Saskatchewan in Alberta, they almost blended 15% hydrogen with natural gas, and people say, like, it's no difference. Appliances could be used, all those standard cords could be met on, the, on those hydrogen transportation. We are proposing a possible solution for that is a hydrogen hub. What hydrogen hub we are proposing is that if we have enough industries, for example, petrochemical in, in, Alberta, in Edmonton, that is Alberta's industrial heartland. So we can propose that we make a hydrogen hub only a specific area where hydrogen could be produced and then utilized on site or maybe in that particular area, five to 10 kilometers. So this is one of the, uh, one of the possible solution that my colleague would uh, talk uh, in detail in, in recommendation for here onward to talk about the demand side, I would ask my colleague Montejama to take forward. Thank you. So uh, my colleague just described the supply side production pathways, and I will discuss end use demand options. Without increasing the demand, Canada will not achieve economies of scale, and the production cost will remain high. Therefore, it is very important to create a market for end use demand of hydrogen. 
For this project, we analyzed end use of hydrogen in four economic sectors, including transportation, building, heating, uh, heavy industry, and oil and gas sector. Today, I will only talk about two key end use demands. So first one is transportation sector. Uh, this sector is the largest contributor to Canada's co carbon emission and is responsible for, uh, sorry, second largest contributor to Canada's carbon emission and is responsible for 25% of the total emission. We have looked into four types of transportation and compared the use of fuel cell versus battery electric as an energy source. Fuel cell electric vehicles are zero emission vehicles that are powered by pure hydrogen gas and stored in a tank on the vehicle. Battery electric vehicles use chemical energy stored in rechargeable battery packs and emit zero carbon. So we have developed uh, a criteria major framework where we used five evaluation criteria, including capital cost, operating cost, efficiency, infrastructure, and environmental sustainability. Capital cost refers to the price of a type of transportation. Operational cost is mainly the average fuel cost. Efficiency indicates how far it can travel with a certain amount of fuel. And infrastructure refers to the availability of refueling or charging stations. Finally, environmental sustainability indicates carbon emission level from the use of each type of transportation. Here, the green tick refers to competitive, red cross is uncompetitive, and the orange circle indicates moderately competitive. NA designates that no data is available for that category. So in this table, the gray rows represent fuel cell electric vehicles, and I will only focus on these. So overall, the regardless of the specific type of fuel cell electric vehicle, lack of infrastructure or fueling stations represent short-term barrier. Particularly for the light duty vehicle, these are not cost competitive and efficient compared to their battery electric alternatives. Therefore, we concluded that for light duty vehicles, hydrogen does not have a market. However, clean hydrogen looks promising for heavy duty vehicles. Uh, for long distance travel, battery electric vehicles are considered inefficient as they require higher charging time and more expensive compared to fuel cell electric buses. In marine, hydrogen may become a promising marine fuel for ships that travel long distances. Similarly, for trains, traveling longer routes can work using hydrogen and existing tracks. Now moving on to industrial applications. The oil and gas sector is responsible for 26% of Canada's total emission, and heavy industry is responsible for 11%. Hydrogen has already a market in this sector. However, hydrogen used in this sector is mainly produced from fossil fuel without CCS. As mentioned by my colleague, uh, with the falling cost of clean hydrogen produced from electrolysis, hydrogen can play a substantial role in the heavy industry sector. So now I hand it over to Hamza for explaining recommendations. Thank you, Tasneem. Uh, so we, we have four key recommendations, and we have divided these um, key recommendations into subparts as well. So our first recommendation is related to uh, production um, pathways. The CNA should advocate for policies that support nuclear-based pathways for clean hydrogen production in the medium to long term while supporting other non-nuclear production pathways in the short term to build to help build robust hydrogen supply chains. Uh, so our first sub recommendation, one A, CNA to advocate and support for the dedicated use of nuclear energy, including small modular reactors for clean hydrogen production. Canada's Canadian government has recently committed to establishing small modular reactors uh, as a source of safe, clean, uh, affordable energy for a low carbon future for Canadians. This commitment to building small modular reactors and to produce clean hydrogen unlocks put, uh, opportunities for hydrogen production in the, in the country. However, the scale needs to be uh, increased significantly. There is also untapped potential for using electrolyzers uh, that can use high temperature heat for nuclear power plants and small modular reactors. Our second uh, key recommendation, 1B, CNA to encourage federal government to systematically phase out high carbon emitting 
hydrogen production by supporting and acquiring carbon capture and storage to abate CO2 emissions in the short term as a bridge until hydrogen production using electricity, clean electricity from solar, wind, uh, hydro and, uh, and nuclear can be fully established. As my colleagues already explained, Canada, has, uh, Canada is producing uh, low cost but high carbon intensive hydrogen by using fossil fuels as a feedstock without applying carbon capture and storage technologies. Uh, as uh, uh, Omar was mentioning, with, without carbon capture and storage, one kilogram of hydrogen produces nine kg of uh, CO2 uh, emissions, uh, which can be reduced significantly. So recently, government has allocated $2.6 billion uh, for using CCS uh, technologies. Third recommendation, 1C, uh, CNA should engage with governments at all levels to abandon the use of uh, color schemes that are used for hydrogen production pathways. I will not go into details as uh, uh, Jacqueline and Umar has already talked about this. Uh, then 1D, thorough engagement and benefit sharing by CNA members uh, with affected indigenous communities. Uh, recommendation 1E, the CNA should engage more with the nuclear industry and federal and provincial governments uh, to improve nuclear waste treatment technology and improve the waste minimization strategy with a particular focus on small modular reactor technology and the challenges around safe transportation and storage. As waste management for nuclear remains a major challenge and, and there is anticipation that with the, with the development of SMRs there will be more waste uh, produced. So CNA needs a clear communication plan uh, to be communicated to the public that this waste will be properly managed uh, uh, by the nuclear industry. Next recommendation, the same. So, <clears throat> recommendation two is about end use demand. And the overall recommendation is the CNA sh uh, should ad advocate for policies that increase end use demand for clean hydrogen, mitigate investment risk, and address market barriers. Recommendation two A. CNA to encourage and lobby with the government to allow tax credits for companies using electrolysis to produce hydrogen. Currently, the hydrogen economy is struggling in emerge in part due to high cost of production of their end use product. Increased government subsidies could help bring the cost down. It is estimated that Canada's carbon tax will yield 66 billions in gross revenue by 2030, and uh, with a significant portion being returned to households. This money could be well spent in funding low carbon hydrogen development projects. Recommendation to be CNA to engage with all tiers of government to ex explore opportunities for developing SMRs near industrial complexes. The government can provide tax credits to industrial companies using electrolysis or fossil fuel with CCS to produce low carbon hydrogen, particularly for ammonia and methanol production. Recommendation to C, CNA to engage with members and other stakeholders for ensuring market certainty for fuel cell electric vehicles by supporting private sector for building hydrogen refueling infrastructure. The government allocated 76 million to address the challenges to the deployment, operation, and management of charging and refueling technologies. However, most of the program achievements are related to the deployment of charging infrastructure of battery electric vehicles. Considering the potential use of hydrogen as transportation fuel, the government needs to utilize more of this fund on building more hydrogen refueling stations. Recommendation 2D, CNA to advocate for clear municipal policies to expand fuel cell electric buses as means of public transportation. So fuel cell electric buses should, uh, could be more advantageous for the Canadian economy than battery electric buses as they can be developed in Canada and not imported. Therefore, the Canadian government should provide more funding to municipalities to purchase more fuel cell electric buses and implement policies to influence mun municipalities so that they introduce these buses as means of public transportation. And finally, recommendation 2F, CNA to lobby for increasing demand-side hydrogen investments, policies, projects to complement the existing supply-side investments. Many of the ongoing financial subsidies are targeting the supply and production side of the emerging economy, whereas the demand side experiences less consistency. Projects to increase demand are done in a sporadic way without any guarantee of ongoing or consistent hydrogen demand. 
Therefore, hydrogen demand must continue increasing in a manner that is reliable, predictable, and consistent. The rest of the recommendations will be explained by Hamza. Yeah, so our uh, third overarching recommendation is promoting research and development and evidence-based policy advocacy. Uh, 3A, in collaboration with the nuclear industry, CNA should design a government relations campaign to urge the government for more R&D expenditures uh, for clean nuclear-based hydrogen production and for the timely allocation of grant resources allocated in the 2022 federal budget. Uh, countries around the world has already increased their R&D expenditure. However, before 2022, Canadian government has actually decreased the uh, uh, allocations for the clean uh, uh, energy production, especially using hydrogen. Uh, next recommendation, 3B Canada, uh, CNA should uh, collaborate with the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association for advocacy and communication campaigns to promote sustained support for R&D, for innovative technology subsidies and cost reduction of fuel cell technologies to support the sector. We are recommending this because firms uh, registered with CHFCA uh, are well positioned to and have a com competitive advantage in supplying fuel cell vehicles like buses, heavy duty vehicles, uh, railways, forklifts, and other hydrogen production, transportation, and storage uh, uh, technologies. Uh, recommendation 3C, CNA to collaborate with think tanks, academia, and other research institutions to conduct uh, research to better understand public and industrial perception, knowledge, and, and willingness about moving towards a hydrogen-based economy particularly one that emphasizes nuclear-based production. So we, here we are recommending two surveys uh, that CNA can conduct in the short term. One is, uh, one is with, the, with the industries which are high carbon emitting and how they, can, uh, get a, how they can use hydrogen to reduce their carbon emissions. And second survey uh, with the general population to understand their knowledge, attitude, perception, their willingness to move towards hydrogen-based economy. Uh, 3D, CNA to develop a communication plan uh, for the financial sector that focuses on the financial needs of uh, nuclear hydrogen uh, producers. We recommend this because as of now, hydrogen uh, uh, economy is not on the radar of the financial sector, as they, are, they, as they can play a significant role in providing finance for the firms in, in who are willing to invest in hydrogen uh, production, supply, and uh, utilization. Our last uh, uh, overarching recommendation, ad advocating for removing market barriers for hydrogen producers through infrastructure uh, development. CNA uh, to engage with players in all part of the value chain to gather an understanding of key legislative and regulatory gaps so that they can be addressed appropriately. Uh, there are strategies, but strategies are not regulations. Private sector is facing a lot of problems uh, when they go and try to implement a hydrogen project. So that is why. Uh, we need a very clear regulatory uh, framework and legislation from the government. Then uh, for BCNA to assist with and learn from the online technical assessment that evaluates hydrogen exports from Canada, uh, CNA must present a case on behalf of the nuclear industry and provide the inputs to build a case uh, of, for using nuclear energy as a feedstock for hydrogen. Uh, Canada is selling oil and natural gas at a very discounted rate to US. Uh, if we produce hydrogen instead of sending that uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, we can gain a lot. We have calculated that the current price of hydrogen for one kilogram in, in California is 13 to $17. But the cost of producing right now in, uh, for a current cost of producing hydrogen in Alberta is just 3 to $4. So there's a lot of uh, profit here uh, for the firms. Then recommendation 4D, CNA to conduct mapping of existing and potential infrastructure for hydrogen hubs and work with the, with the nuclear industry to establish SMRs in regions where hydrogen deployment hubs are feasible. And this is our one of the key recommendations because this will help to co-locate demand and production of hydrogen uh, uh, in, in the country. Uh, we have highlighted few places where uh, these hubs can be developed, as Umar touched on one, which is the Alberta Heartland. Uh, then there is coastal ports in British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic region, the transportation corridor between Montreal and uh, Detroit, nuclear chemical industries in GTA, and uh, Venice uh, near Quebec. So we developed this uh, action plan for our uh, recommendation. These are sub-recommendations sub on the production, demand, research and development, and market values, um, key activities that are required uh, for each of these, uh, uh, these sub-recommendations. And 
the timeline where this, uh, these activities should be, uh, can be implemented. Now I, I would like to hand over uh, for the final slide to Jackie. Hydrogen will certainly play a role in Canada's energy transition. However, the specifics of how this might look are still being decided. For nuclear energy to be able to supply clean hydrogen, the hydrogen economy must first be scaled. Today's policy actions will have long-lasting effects on Canada's carbon, em carbon emissions and on Canada's role as a global leader in clean energy technologies. It is important that today's policy actions are bold and effective and that they consider all parts of the hydrogen value chain. The CNA has the potential to be a player during this pivotal time in the energy transition by supporting the development of a hydrogen-based economy, thereby creating an opportunity in the long term for Canada's nuclear industry to play a role in pioneer pioneering hydrogen to nuclear technology and in becoming an advocate for integrated clean energy systems. Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. We thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. That's exactly 30 minutes, right? So. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect time. OK, thank you very much, uh, Team CNA. OK, uh, I'm going to turn it over to the judges for 10 minutes. Mr. Moderator would not like to come to the front of the room to moderate the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. All right. Does that work? Does it work? But am I allowed to move? Uh, stay in the camera. Don't move too much right. the camera. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, we're turning it over to the judges for questions. Take it away, judges. Leslie, you're first. Okay, I guess I'm first. You got a um, microphone in your hand. You I look do. Like you're it was right by me. Chomping so at that worked. Um, hi, thanks for a very good presentation um, and a good analysis. Um, I have um, a question about the safety perceptions, um, particularly of nuclear energy, uh, and the extent to which that was integrated into your analysis. I see that it was one of your criteria, and it was the only one on that safety list that got less than a green check mark, right? <laughs> so how are you addressing that in all of this and how big of an issue do you think that could potentially be in trying to make this um, a reality? So in terms of safety, we consider, considered the perception basically of safety with the general population as we all heard about Chernobyl, for example. So there are some serious concerns about the safety, so we are recommending that CNA should conduct a survey uh, which understands the, the safety concerns thoroughly. There, there are a few examples we noted in our report. In Australia, they did a similar survey they did in, in England. And CNA to develop a communication plan based on, based on uh, those surveys and advocacy campaign. Second is related to the waste, waste management. Uh, which also comes as a major concern for for uh, for the safety uh, regulations. Um, so the, uh, Canada uh, is really advanced in terms of its technologies to uh, to dispose of this waste or to reuse it or uh, some other uh, some other uh, utilities for this waste. Uh, they have already passed uh, a regulation recently on the waste management and. Uh, there is already funding available for uh, waste management. So we just need a clear communication plan uh, which, which can help uh, to deal with the issue of safety. Of course, we will not be able to convince everybody, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing. Leslie, do you want to follow up on that? Let me think about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that this was not an easy project and very, very complex, but this is cutting edge, so congratulations on all your work so far. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, you were doing a project for the Canadian Nuclear Association, so your lens, the hydrogen, is just one piece, but you have such a long list of recommendations. If you were to prioritize these recommendations and the association could only do three things, what would they be? Because uh, under each recommendation, A, B, C, D, E, I was like, wow. How, you know, that prioritization 
from your own perspective, what are the most important things that have to move the needle? So that's the first question. Then the second is, you did touch on some ben benchmarking from other countries, but what key best practice can this association d adopt from another country that has a similar association that has worked? So, uh, thank you for the question. So the very first recommendation, the only recommendation, if we were asked only one recommendation, then we would have asked CNA to advocate for production of a lot of green electricity because we want to switch the whole this uh, uh, hydrogen production through clean uh, electricity, through electrolysis, so that we have zero emissions for hydrogen production. Unless we do that, we are nowhere in this game. Like, we can only stay with this fossil fuel, and then that is about nine kilograms of carbon dioxide production for one kilogram of hydrogen. So the very one first recommendation for long term, short term, whatever way is possible to have enough green electricity. That, that And that is how CNA should advocate for only that one thing. For other two recommendations, I would ask, I mean, since we, 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 we think, uh, we discuss with the, our sponsor, like their uh, uh, research capacity and in terms of funding, so I think we recommended only all those things which somehow, because CNA's mandate is essentially advocacy and engagement with all those uh, partners and industries in nuclear energy and uh, uh, particularly in Ontario's uh, energy sector. So we we always recommended or we try to recommend only those things that comes in, in line to advocacy and engagement since I think with that, that is what their mandate is. But SMR technology that is kind of emerging technology for that small modular reactor which are portable energy uh, nuclear uh, technology that could be placed in the, the second recommendation hydrogen hub and then identification of those hydrogen hubs and then placement and deployment of those SMR technologies that are still yet in establishing means they're not fully established but to identify, identify the hydrogen hubs and then placement of those SMRs right in those hydrogen hubs could be uh, something that we would recommend. Uh, I think that's, uh, if anybody else wants to add. Second question on, on the countries that, uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, best practices, I think we can uh, we can learn a lot from what France uh, currently is doing. Uh, with, uh, with this Ukraine war, the energy crisis has uh, worsened for many countries. So they are moving back to uh, nuclear, uh, using nuclear as a source of uh, energy production. Belgium just did that recently, they, they are, so, for example, Germany uh, halted their plans to move completely out of nuclear uh, energy production. So, because uh, of what's happening right now with the energy crisis. So, I think European Union has really good uh, examples. Natalie. Hello. I have a question around the effectiveness of the different production possibilities. And there was a question around the moderate rating you put for the economic efficiency of hydropower. So I wondered about that, and I also wondered in the context of our Canadian capacity for hydropower, would we be better to stop exporting hydropower and to transfer that excess capacity to hydrogen production? So those are my questions. Uh, Thanks, it's uh, coming to production pathways again. I would, I would like to talk on that. So yeah, that is true. Like we are always told in Canada that Quebec is producing a lot of electricity, but that when you go into details is not enough because Quebec is made, I mean, Hydro Quebec is made, making a lot of new agreements, particularly in states in uh, United States. So what we are thinking right now, electricity, although as I, I said before, like we are thinking there's a lot of electricity in Canada, prices are so low. For example, in, in case of Quebec, we have seven cent per kilowatt hour, uh, production price for electricity, but this hydrogen production and the electrolysis process is very high energy intensive process. For uh, just to give a context, for example, right now we are producing about three million tons of hydrogen. We would need about 8.8 .8 gigawatt of electricity. And right now, what we are producing in Alberta's context, for example, only we are only producing through hydrogen and wind about 750 mil, uh, uh, megawatts. Uh, on, uh, from Bruce Power Plant in Ontario, we are producing about maybe 680 megawatts. So we need about 22 such nuclear power plants, or maybe we, we, we want to use about 10 times more what we are producing in, from those uh, different sources. 
That is why we are, we are means uh, saying we have not enough electricity. First thing is to have enough electricity, and that is one point. Like we can somehow regulate, or we can ask these hydro Quebec and such uh, hydropower plants to dedicate some of the electricity for hydrogen through some legislate. I'm not sure if legislative process is the right way to go, but this could be means they could be asked to use, means the fundings could be associated with them for dedicated use of their electricity for hydrogen production. That is one way to go, so yeah. Any other questions from judges? Okay, now we're going to sponsors. Hi, I'm John Stewart. I was the uh, Canadian Nuclear Association's representative on this project, even though I'm now completely retired from the CNA. Um, Excellent work. I'm very happy with the way this came out. Uh, also very well presented. So thanks to the four of you. Um, I've got uh, just one quick technical question and then a number of uh, comments that are at a higher level. On uh, the water that is used in steam methane reforming, how much water is that in practical terms? And did that uh, water use get factored into the environmental impact uh, calculations? So, yeah, this is... Uh I'm sorry, I could not give the exact, like, I'm not sure if anyone else has some point, like, I'm not sure exact amount of water, but there are certain studies, and we definitely, I, I saw somewhere how much water is used, and if that is, that steam, actually, it's used in form of steam, and how does it go, and then what's the process, like, if it becomes a tailing water, like what's happened in Alberta, like, the water is not usable again, you have to treat, or is it treatable? I'm not sure about that, sorry for that, so we, we'll look into that. Okay, thanks. Um, I just have a string of quick comments on higher level issues. Um, on hydroelectricity, um, there are many um, grave constraints on developing more hydroelectricity in Canada. Um, and, um, you know, if you doubt that, talk to some of the people who are trying to build Site C in British Columbia or some of the other large projects. And one of those constraints is the extremely long transmission lines that are required now. Um, the transmission line is as hard to build as the dam itself because of the land that has to be crossed and the indigenous rights on that land, which have changed dramatically since the 1970s. Um, so it's as hard to build a transmission line on that scale as to build a pipeline on that scale, and both are very, very hard to do. Um, the whole reason that Ontario went to nuclear starting in the early 60s, they were really planning it in the 50s, was that they had run out of good sites for large hydro development. So hydro had worked brilliantly for Ontario, but they had no more good places. And they needed a, um, an alternative that was relatively clean, that um, used their engineering potential. Nuclear took Ontario's engineering establishment to a higher level. And uh, the advantage of nuclear was you could put the uh, plant relatively close to cities if you wanted to and shorten the transmission line, which was a giant advantage. The plant can be where the wires can conveniently go because they're not, a nuclear plant isn't particularly constrained on where it goes and it doesn't use a lot of land. Um, so, um, you know, there's not much, there's not much scope or it's going to be very, very hard to expand hydro a lot in Canada. We might, we're going to need that power and we're going to need to combine it with lots of other things. So it's going to be very constrained. A quick comment on the financial sector. You mentioned the need to deal with the financial sector in developing financing um, for hydrogen and particularly nuclear hydrogen. Um, I think probably, you know, if you look at the adventurous capital that is patient, it tends to be on the private capital side rather than on the private equity side rather than in the public institutions. So I suspect, I don't know much about the topic, but I suspect if anybody was going to go out and try to educate the financial sector about this, you'd really want to be talking to the big private equity firms rather than to the banks um, who have so many other limits on what they do. Um, you know, if you look at the really adventurous financing of space ventures and, uh, you know, uh, really ambitious technology ventures, it tends to be private capital. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, exporting gas or hydrogen. Um, I wouldn't count on um, having a lot more pipeline capacity getting built, no matter what you're carrying in it. Because um, although opponents of pipelines like Keystone um, purport to be um, against the development of the fossil fuel industry, 
uh, a lot of the effect of opposition to pipelines is just about the pipeline itself. It's about the actual construction of actual pipes across actual land. And it wouldn't make that much difference, in my personal opinion, if you were putting something clean through that pipeline. You'd still have an awfully hard time getting the pipeline built. Um, my last comment is that um, for best practices internationally, as somebody who spent 10 years in you know, advocating for clean energy in Ottawa, and then before that, you know, working with Washington a lot, the best possible practice is to develop bipartisan support. Um, you can cook up support in one political party, but then you get stop-start policies. Um, and you get a perception publicly that the policy is associated with one party or the other. Um, the best thing that has happened in the United States is that nuclear is politically neutral. Um, both Democrats and Republicans support it um, pretty smoothly, and so policies tend to be consistent. Now, policies are not as supportive as the industry would like them to be, but at least they don't stop and start every four or eight years. So best practices, make sure your public advocacy efforts are more um, nonpartisan. Sorry to take so long. Unless there's anything else from judges or sponsors, then I'm going to open it up to the floor. So anybody have a question? Put up your hand, please. Daniel. Yeah. So this is this is uh, in a way a follow up to. I'm sorry. I, I, one of the. The, the judge who's... Um, Leslie, and Natalie. Yeah, uh, um, So, um, who asked you if you had to... I mean, it's, it, the presentation was fantastic. Uh, I learned a lot from listening to you. Sorry, I was a few, minute, a few minutes late. Blame the orange cones in Montreal for that. Um, but um, it, it, it was a very intricate proposal in terms of the number of things uh, that you were suggesting and, and, you know, the real world, the likelihood that all those things could get... Uh, implemented in a timely manner. So I think you know the, the, the question of which three you would prioritize uh, is an important one. But at the same time, the question that I had is, to what degree do, do all these things sort of fit together? In other words, uh, to what degree is extracting three or four or five of these proposals uh, not so much second best, you know, in the real, in the, an ideal world we do all these things, but in the real world we can only do four. To what degree do those four, those three or whatever, require that some of the other things uh, at, that you kind of dropped uh, also get done. Um, so to what degree is this kind of like a modular thing where you can you can take things out and you know put things back in? Um, and to what degree is it kind of more a systemic thing where all or a lot of these uh, things have to go together in order for any one of them to achieve its objectives? Is that clear for Monday morning? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, that's a good question, Professor Weinstock. Um, so for our recommendations, we kind of viewed the key one as we, we want to prioritize the transition to clean, green energy. Um, and that is uh, our first recommendation about, the, about this. And that we kind of have different timelines. So in the short run, um, we're recommending more use of those green um, green electricity sources for electrolysis because that's simply what's feasible now. And in the long run, we ultimately want to transition that to nuclear. And that is kind of the, the essence of our recommendations. And then a lot of the other stuff that we have, um, I, I'd say particularly in market barriers um, and demand is kind of intended to support that primary recommendation because we kind of early on identified that although we do need to improve, um, I guess, the amount and quality of, of the production sources that we do have, that's only half of the equation, and you need to kind of equally balance that with the demand side. So like, there's no reason to transition to nuclear energy if there's no demand for hydrogen, particularly hydrogen produced from nuclear. Um, so kind of a alongside the primary recommendation that's addressing the, the production side of it, we, um, that's kind of where the, the points on increasing demand and removing some of those market barriers to come in to kind of make it easier to, um, to, to, to scale up that production and kind of um, offer those supports and remove some of those barriers to kind of help expedite it, given that it is quite challenging. 
Um, so they all they all do work together. There is a Q1, and the other ones are kind of I'd say more so supplement suppl supplementary, sorry, to make the key recommendation easier to to implement or to realize. Anything else? Any other question? If there's no other question from the floor, then I've got a question. Uh, so my question connects to some of John's comments and Natalie's question. Um, I guess I'm wondering whether your view of the world here is that um, the Canadian government, or maybe provincial governments as well, should be prioritizing the generation of nuclear power so that you can use that electricity to produce the hydrogen, or whether it's just one of several things that we should be doing. So, Umar, when you responded to Natalie's question and you said something like we'd have to have 20 Bruce power plants or something like that, I thought that was, oh, okay, if we need 20 of those, then maybe this isn't going to happen uh, because true. there's lots of obstacles to nuclear. But there's lots, lots of obstacles to more hydro. There's lots of obstacles to using fossil fuels with CCS, in particular the CCS. So I'm wondering whether, you know, is it the case that nuclear's obstacles are more easily surmountable than hydro's obstacles or CCS's obstacles? Or should governments be pushing on all fronts? I guess that's the question. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is how we framed our recommendations. For, I mean, this is why we are saying okay, let's not switch from all the way fossil fuel, what we are producing, right away to nuclear. What we are saying is just go through transition path, just bring in this CCS technology because government just funded like about $2.6 billion. Use that CCS technology, bring those like this, uh, that US tax Q45, if such tax is implemented, we calculated or we actually got that from literature. The hydrogen production price would be competitive to what right now it, it is for, from fossil fuel. So that could be a transition path, like that could be a transition, a bridge, that CCS with fossil fuel. Use that for a few years until we have enough hydrogen demand, then electro, uh, uh, electrolyzer prices are way too high, those meantime could come down. If, we, if investors are seeing a lot of hydrogen demand, they'll definitely put their money. They can bring those electro, uh, electrolyzer prices down, SMR prices that are about $500, which are expected to decrease up to $350 megawatt per, uh, $350 per megawatt. So these are all those factors what are actually saying, okay, let's go fossil fuel with carbon capturing and storage, and then switch to uh, wind and hydro. And then there could be nuclear who is now having this uh, uh, complete market that, that we can utilize there means uh, the electricity that is produced through those SMR technologies that is still in the in the establishing phase. Like it's not fully established yet. So all those things in parallel, that is what we had a uh, criteria practicality and then other uh, scalability. So these are two different aspects we looked into very in all those details and recommending on these. This should be done short term, short to medium, medium to long. So this is how it should be. Uh, Nadidi, and then John. Sorry, just building on this question, you know, you have advocacy as one of your biggest intervention areas, but you can't, you're not operating in a vacuum. Other people are also advocating for their own source of true. energy. Yeah. How yeah. will you surmount that? Um, and, you know, because that's one thing I didn't see in the paper, it's in the brief, is really how you, you're not, you know, how do you, how do you make your voice loud, clear, and c compelling relative to other sources of energy that are also have the associations pushing for them. The biggest competition that we expect is coming from solar and wind because for Hydro Quebec, like building a new dam and then uh, problems associated with transmission, new land, that would be a huge problem actually for companies like Hydro Quebec to build their case against nuclear. The only thing that can compete with is solar and wind. And we are not putting a, com means we are not asking for a competition between nuclear and these two because we think solar and wind still, like we need almost, almost like 10 times what Alberta is producing. So those companies, then there should be negotiation among all those uh, uh, key players that, 
okay, we, if we work all together, still we are not there, but the electricity is needed for clean hydrogen. And I think they must be calculating those things. And then the biggest competition, again, what I'm trying to say is, would be from solar and wind, and those technologies are also not as established as people think that, okay, renewable is something okay, that's coming in next year. It's not coming there. So I think it's very good chance for uh, CNA to work with nuclear industry and to build, like, if they can capitalize on this SMR technology, they would be the ultimate winners, I guess. John. Yeah, I have a, an answer to Nandini's question. Um, the advocacy system is a little bit antiquated in that it's structured fuel by fuel. So we have a solar association and a hydro association and a wind association and so on, nuclear association. And, you know, what's really needed, of course, is an integrated clean energy system. I mean, the whole reason nuclear worked in Ontario and became 62% of Ontario's electricity supply today is that it partnered perfectly with hydro. So it was a perfectly integrated clean solution, nuclear and hydro together. Um, we really need a, an advocacy uh, front for cl integrated clean energy, transition to integrated clean energy systems. And my former boss, John Gorman, who's the head of the Nuclear Association, came over from solar because that was what he wanted to do. He had already built uh, or helped to build uh, an association that brought together solar, wind, and hydro, right, in a, in a renewables association or a, at least a sort of alliance of renewables association. And then the next step was to bring nuclear into that so that you had integrated um, clean energy uh, advocates working together. Because th some of these associations just don't have any um, weight by themselves. I mean, I can tell you as director of policy and research at CNA for 10 years that, you know, our resources were just too small. You needed to build a bigger alliance. Um, the other, I, sorry, I had another comment, but I got to remember what it was. Uh, oh, to Chris's uh, remark, you know, that, um, you know, 20 or 25 new big nuclear plants aren't going to happen. Um, that's like saying in 1990, well, we need, the world needs a million new mainframe computers, right? Well, what ended up happening, I will continue talking, sorry, but it won't be long. What ended up happening was we got a billion or several billion laptops, right? So yes, it might be hard to do 22 new Bruce power plants, but it might not be hard to do 1,000 60 megawatt SMRs or 10,000 6 megawatt SMRs, which could go in all kinds of Arctic villages and solve all kinds of carbon yeah. emission problems. Thanks. Okay, folks, we have, unless there's, Natalie, I'm going to turn it over to you. If, if, no? Okay. Thank you so much. That was great. So thank you, team. <laughs> Terrific. Well done, folks. <laughs>